Hi, I'm Chris Rowan, and I'm going to talk about speech interfaces on IoT. In some ways, it seems counterintuitive that when we are working on Internet of Things, people play a prominent role. But in fact, many of the devices that we expect to see proliferate and which will interact autonomously with the real world have from time to time compelling reasons why we need a human in the loop to control them, to start them, to stop them, to, to uh, get them to do the things they want. And many of the interesting small edge devices we care about will be interacting with people all the time. And so we naturally want natural devices. And that means using a human's preferred user interface, which is speech. So I'm going to talk about how speech recognition works, and really often how it doesn't work. What are some of the major challenges that you face, particularly in real world environments that are full of noise and other impairments? And then delve a little bit into the fact it's actually even worse than that. There are a whole set of limitations of the way that we do speech recognition today, which are really problematic if we're going to make it uh, work in the real world and be ubiquitous and, and natural. And in order to do that, we're going to get a chance to recast the problem, to turn the way that speech recognition at the state of the art has been recently done and turn it upside down. And then we'll talk about the implementations and the implications for what Babel Labs has been doing with noise robust command recognition, talking in detail about the structures of the recognizers and optimizations for small devices, especially ARM uh, M series devices, and then some of the deeper lessons about how you go about thinking of the uses and the creation of speech interfaces. So let's start with looking at the noisy speech problem, where we have uh, really a set of, uh, a simple case we'll start with, just a series of commands, but at different noise levels. A high signal to noise ratio, like this 20 dB signal to noise ratio, is very clear. Let's play that clip. clip. I think we'll need audio. Previous. Command seven. Go right. Power off. All right, and you see there, I've used a state-of-the-art uh, cloud-based speech recognition system just as a reference. And in fact, IBM Watson gets all of those uh, seven phrases exactly correct. But then I start turning up the noise. And let's play the next one to get an idea of what noisy. <laughs> Okay, that's good. I think we can take the volume down just a little bit. And you can see that there starts to be some problems in the machine transcription of that, uh, of that sequence of phrases. It's getting a, them partly right. Some of it's missing entirely. Others, it's getting a word out of two or three. Now let's turn up the noise even, even more, or let's turn down the, the, uh, the speech. So let's hear what it's like at zero dB. Power on. Go left. So it's largely obscured. And in fact, the IBM Watson system uh, even only attempts one word out of the 20 or so uh, in that, or. Uh, 15 in that, in that sequence. And if I went to minus 3 dB, which I won't do here, it gets none of them. It's just too much noise. There's too much ambiguity about what were the proper words being said there. And this is 
a problem which plays out any time you take a modern speech recognition system into a noisy environment. Now, there's a reason why Alexa is really built for the living room, because the living room's a really quiet place. This does not work as well in the kitchen or outdoors or on the factory floor, and it's a serious impediment to the use of speech recognition as a fundamental interface, especially as you get into more mission-critical kinds of applications. It's fine for entertainment purposes, but when there's people's lives at stake, you may not be so tolerant of, uh, of uh, large numbers of errors in that interface. So what's happening? Why is it hard to do this? Part of the reason is the structure of speech recognition systems that's commonly evolved, where we really today typically have some sort of noise filtering to attempt to remove some of the noise, then an acoustic model which takes that waveform and extracts the most likely sequence of phonemes, and then a language model which takes a sequence of phonemes and finds the most likely sequence of words in the target language, say English, and then finally, you have a natural language application, which takes a string of text and attempts to interpret it. And for simple interfaces, that means typically looking for certain key phrases or key words uh, within that text stream. So if we had a phrase like power on, we would get a sequence of a few phonemes that you see there, power on. The language model, hopefully, would detect that that was power on, and then the natural language application would say, ah, I found power on, and I'm going to call some function which is associated with the recognition of that, uh, of that specific command. <coughs> but what happens if the acoustic model gets it just a little bit wrong? Because I may have had a bit of noise right there when I was saying on, so somehow it came out power in. Well, now the language model is going to report power in, and the natural language application may say, I don't know what power in is about. I have no idea what to do here. What's really missing is that there isn't typically a way, not an efficient way, to feedback from the natural language application to say, you know, in reality, I'm only interested in a finite number of phrases such that I want to constrain the choices of what phonemes and words I'm going to find based on what does the application really care about. So when you have continuous speech recognition, I'm dictating my great new novel, then I really probably want to constrain it only to the typical patterns found in the English language. But when I'm building a specific grammar of a user interface, then I do want to constrain it. I really want, in some sense, to build a microphone that only hears the phrases I care about at that particular point in time. And that leads to a different way of looking at the problem. In addition to all that, you have a set of issues associated with that cloud-based uh, system. Um, even for a small vocabulary, going through that entire string of uh, acoustic model, language model, natural language application is pretty expensive. That these uh, speech recognition systems in the cloud are typically requiring many gigaflops and hundreds of megabytes of working memory uh, as, uh, as a rule. Second, you are handing it off to the cloud, and passing private human speech through the cloud creates some well-documented uh, issues. You have a latency issue. It's hard to do anything in the cloud with a full round-trip response time through uh, a natural language application with this kind of a stack in less than a second or so. And finally, you have the weakest link phenomenon that if you're relying on the cloud, then your natural language application, your user interface, only works when you're connected. All of those may make the uh, use of cloud-based continuous speech recognition inappropriate for an important class of applications. 
So let's recast the problem. Uh, we're really going to say, well, let's take all of those things, the noise filter, the acoustic model, the language model, the natural language application, which were previously separate module, uh, and certainly the acoustic model and the language model increasingly deep learning based, and let's build a unified neural network model that effectively does all of those things together, takes in raw noisy speech and puts out the, uh, the recognized command signals for a finite vocabulary. And when you do that, you actually have an opportunity to make something significantly smaller. And because it's trained for noise and because it is built to focus on the phrases of interest, it can actually be significantly more robust than the much larger cloud-based models. So if we were to take those same sequences, and I won't play them again, and we look at what a low-cost, edge-based, noise-optimized uh, speech recognition model can do for a vocabulary, in this case of 22 phrases, of which this is a, a modest subset, you can see that across those different noise level, it gets it all right down to the minus 3 dB case, which is barely intelligible by humans. And there, it misses one command, and it uh, somehow misrecognized command seven as go down. So it is essentially went from 0% recognition to about 80 or 90% recognition under fairly severe conditions. That seems like that could be a useful building block. We can look at this another way and just say, well, let's take the whole command set, uh, in this case, a larger command set of 80 different phrases corresponding to 35 distinct functions. And in this case, we built models in this uh, Babel Lab's clear command system, and we ran them through uh, Google uh, Cloud Voice, which is, I think, probably the best in the world today in terms of noise robustness for a cloud-based speech recognition system. But what you find is as you get over there into the low dB, negative dB, you tend to find that speech recognition systems fall off a bit of a cliff. That the ambiguity about what was the phoneme stream, what was the word stream, becomes very severe. Now, any system is going to have some compromise of the accuracy, but you can see that we're comfortably in the 80 to 90% accuracy uh, range at zero dB versus about 60% correct uh, recognition for a system that's about three orders of magnitude bigger in compute and, and memory requirements. So it feels like we're moving in the right direction. So what does this neural network look like to do this? Um, we have an overall flow of um, the sound signal coming through from one or several microphones, it goes through some activity detection, goes through some normalization to adjust the gain, it goes through an optional beamformer and acoustic echo cancellation to handle multiple microphones and to eliminate uh, known uh, content uh, from the speakers. Um, we move into the spectral domain. We've chosen a set of... Uh, of 2D networks that operate in time and frequency domain. And then we go into what is actually a fairly universal classifier engine, which can do classification of a wide range of different kinds of information from audio streams. It just so happens that recognizing speech is one of the really interesting problems to go do. Um, and that then directly produces signals associated with the different classes. What we have here is some, some exploration of the size of models that could be interesting. And this is the, uh, here are the sizes in uh, number of weights in the model uh, for uh, 
a certain class of noise across a 22 command command set. So, and what you see is that um, having a bigger model works up until a certain point. The, the, the 100K model is, is clearly worse than the 136K model, but then we kind of are saturating in terms of accuracy that going to 166 or to 200 kilobyte, kiloweight uh, model isn't buying us much for this particular command set. And so we want to find that knee of the curve in sizing our model appropriately to, to recognize this. Uh, we also uh, can effectively uh, do this same modeling across a range of different vocabularies, noise types, and as we'll talk about in a moment, different kinds of classes besides vocabulary. The universal classifier is a configurable deep neural network that can span quite a range of, uh, of different tasks. We, in fact, use the same generator for both the wake word and the phrase recognition. The wake word is typically a small network which is intended to uh, just listen continuously for a phrase. I mean, in the style of Siri, hey Alexa, hey Google. It can be anything we want, and it often is something that's branded or associated with a major function class, like it would be the name of an appliance. But then we want to go to a second larger network, which is going to classify any one of a number of commands. And we've looked at command sets sort of from 10 commands up to 100 commands as being the interesting range. Now it turns out that same basic idea of classifying mixtures of speech and noise and other information can equally be well used for classifying the noise. That is, ignore the speaker, tell me what was the background noise. Or ignore the words, tell me who said it or tell me what the native language was of the person who spoke in English, or just tell me what was the noise level associated with it. And all of those have been uh, efforts that we have done, at least in prototype form, but our primary focus is on the wake word and the phrase recognition. It's also very scalable, both because different problems have different demands and because different budgets in different kinds of devices allow you, force you, to make trade-offs between accuracy and compute resources. Um, and so we can change the activation depths, the layer sequences, the size of the temporal window, the transform type and depth, the step size that we take in uh, analyzing continuous speech, the way we mix together noise and speech and reverberation, and uh, the exact details of that network. The, the, the details of the network are proprietary, but it's very much in the style of a ResNet or a SqueezeNet. We found that we emphatically get more bang for the buck with these models which have residual connections and which work on many layers. So we're typically running more than 25 layers through this network. We also allow for a wide range of implementations. And so we have built our own quantization and code optimization framework, which allows us to work in FP32, uh, int 16, int 8, or combinations if it works as a better uh, compute and uh, resource trade-off. So one of the most common uses is doing trigger and command. And it's worth taking a look at some of the, the issues that are there. We have um, certainly uh, a model in which we do not do any noise filtering beforehand. We rely on the neural network to do all of the noise filtering. Uh, we are uh, building uh, significant command sets now for a range of different clients. Uh, one of our, our popular 
uh, demos is something that we uh, uh, defined in conjunction with our chip partner, NXP. And what we see is that um, that structure allows us to uh, show the impact of uh, this, this better training and implementation model. Here's one example. Um, DSP Concepts and Sensory have done excellent work together in uh, combining noise filtering and, and trigger word, and they've published some data that confirms this tendency to see a significant reduction in accuracy as noise level increases. If you take our equivalent uh, trigger phrase, uh, we see, yes, some roll off, but at a much higher noise level before we start to see impairment of trigger accuracy. And um, if you look at a whole command set, it does see more roll off as a function of, of noise, but you're, we're still in the 85% accuracy range for trigger plus command combined at zero dB. So that the usefulness of the, uh, this kind of model extends well out into the negative dB uh, sort of range. And in fact, let me give you a couple of examples of what that's like here. So <clears throat> with the gods of live demos willing, uh, let me, so this is a little NXP demo, demo board. It has a, a Cortex M7 uh, running at five or 600 mega, megahertz in it. It's a, an uh, <clears throat> IMX RT1060 uh, device. Uh, <clears throat> we're actually, we're using a few hundred K of flash and only about 100 kilobytes of RAM in this device. Nevertheless, I can say, uh, hello, Gabby, command one. Command one complete. Hello, Gabby, command 12. Command 12 complete. Hello, Gabby, power on. Hello, Gabby, power on. What's wrong with you? Hello, Gabby, power on. Power is on. Okay. And then I can just train it for a different language. So here's another one. <clears throat> Hola, Gabi. Commando uno. Command one complete. Hola, Gabi. Commando doce. Hola, Gabi. Commando, do oh, I think I, uh, that isn't right. My Spanish isn't very good. Hola, Gabi. Commando doce. Command 12 complete. Hola, Gabi. Poder prendido. Power is on. All right. So we get, <clears throat> independent of the language, it's just a training question, independent of the, the uh, multi-level network, we can build these very noise robust recognizers. So let's talk a little bit about implementations. So I referred to the, uh, the NXP one, which is on a Cortex M7. Um, if we look at that, that range of, uh, of noise levels, sort of the 40 to 10 dB uh, <clears throat> range, we're talking about accuracies uh, individually for trigger and for command in the two to 3% range. The average megahertz requirement is only about 70 megahertz for that noise robust trigger phrase recognition. Once you've recognized a trigger, <clears throat> it's a more complex network to recognize the commands and that requires about 180 megahertz of, of compute. We've also been working with Ambic um, <clears throat> and focused on the uh, Apollo 3 Blue, which is a more constrained device, but a more constrained network can fit and can give you ultra low power implementation of the same command uh, plus trigger uh, implementation. And then we've even been seeing how do we shoehorn trigger down into a Cortex M0. And we're actually seeing quite good results. That is things approaching about 95% accuracy uh, running in just a few small single digit number of multiplies per second. So comfortably within 40 megahertz are running on a Cortex M0 and fitting in total code plus model plus input buffers plus working RAM 
in under the um, 90 kilobyte uh, total budget that's an available in a, in a particular device. Typically, we're running bare metal. We also have a version that runs all this under an Android framework. Um, and we, while we generate code on our own, we explicitly use the CMSIS library because that allows us to, to get the most out of the available multipliers. This really is a multiply ad bound task especially because we've done a number of really important optimizations in our sliding window to allow us to get to very small memory footprint so that we make compute the bound for this. <clears throat> so this isn't just a question of, well, how do you optimize code for an ARM? It's also a question of how do you design a good command set? Uh, <clears throat> certainly you have to think about the human factor side of it. For something like power on, there might be just one way to say it. But if you want to know what time it is, do you say time, or what time is it, or tell me the time? You may need several different phrases that correspond to the same function. And that's a natural part of this uh, data gathering and training method. There's also a number of things to think about in the exact choice of supported phrases, not just intuitiveness. It's better to have more syllables. A longer trigger phrase is easier to disambiguate from the background noise. You'd like the commands to differ from one another in as many uh, syllables as possible. And in general, you, want to, you like longer commands over shorter commands because they're more robust, they're more differentiated, they're more distinctive. And if possible, if you can choose commands that use distinctive phonemes uh, rather than less distinct phonemes, that's good too. So if you just look at a standard phoneme occurrence chart in, in English, you find that the, the, the confusion is least if you use lots of consonants with t, k, s, sh, j, o, and er, and avoid those softer ones, the v's and th's and, and, uh, and n's and m's. Those are soft. Those are easily confused with one another. Those are going to lead to greater uh, chance of ambiguity. Of course, you don't always get to choose the phrases. And we build the system so that it's robust with whatever uh, phrases are chosen, but you can help yourself out. So what are the implications of this? Command recognition does play an important role in speech-powered system. It really enables us to think about speech recognition in lots more places, uh, especially when it's done at the edge, because it can be more noise robust, more private, lower latency, less sensitive to network outage. And obviously, being at the edge, we have all of the usual benefits in terms of energy. I, I think command recognition also co complements cloud-based speech recognition systems, because clearly, we're not going to be able to recognize you know, huge vocabularies with those tiny resources that you may have available in a device like, like this. And so picking off what are the, you know, the 10% the of the vocabulary of an interface, which is used 90% of the time, may be a very good strategy. We can do this because of really careful co-design. We are looking carefully at that signal processing stack. And we can think of the deep learning network as really a kind of signal processing. We look at how we went about crowdsourcing the data collection so that we can make this a bundled service. You don't come to Babel Labs to say, implement my, uh, my, my data set. You come to us and say, I've got an idea for a vocabulary. And we, over a course of three or four weeks, will crowdsource the data, cleanse the data, train the network, and optimize the code for the target system. You also have to think about trade-offs at work between vocabulary size and robustness needs. At one end, you have dictation 
kinds of applications, or information browsing, or music browsing, as you might find in a car infotainment system today. Large vocabulary, not really mission critical. At the other end of the spectrum, you have things used by first responders. You have industrial IoT. If you're going to actually control features of your car with voice, then you sure as hell better make sure it does what you say. And so looking at the application tells you a lot about whether the big cloud or the small edge recognition is going to be uh, more appropriate. And finally, to, to wrap up, there are some clear lessons that apply to this speech problem, but I think more generally apply to, uh, to building real systems with voice. The data set quality is critically important, that if you can get more noise and more example speech, then you will be able to train better models. Even really tiny models want high quality data. Pronunciation diversity is the great challenge in these speech systems. Uh, we need it for a variety of reasons to make it robust, to make it fair, um, but we don't even have in the industry great vocabulary to talk about accent diversity. If you ask a customer, well, what accents do you want to cover? They say, well, all of them. <laughs> uh, well, what's the distribution of how much Hispanic versus Chinese versus Indian versus British versus European? So we actually explicitly go out around the world and we get example data from all of the different demographics. As you can see in some of the trade-offs, people always want more accuracy, but there are clearly uh, nonlinear relationships. You sometimes have to make dramatic increases in the amount of data and the amount of compute in order to get small improvements in, in accuracy. But we can do clever data augmentation to and augment with noise and augment with reverberation and augment with various variations on the speech pattern in order to get the equivalent of millions of speakers under millions of different scenarios. But it's also important for us to take a holistic view on efficiency and accuracy. It's not just a question of did you do the right thing in the implementation code or in the training. It is a the combined effect of the data collection, the data curation, the algorithm design, and the implementation design that leads you uh, to that. So that's what we've been uh, spending a lot of time on at, at Babel Labs. You haven't heard much about Babel Labs, but we are a Silicon Valley uh, startup. We're about 30 people now, about half PhDs, building speech recognition and speech enhancement technologies uh, and we look forward to talking with you more uh, as the rest of the day goes on. Thanks very much.